All right, let's jump right into the Word of God. Uh, if you have your Bible, let's turn to the greatest book in the entire Bible, Mark. <clears throat> Mark chapter 15, Mark chapter 15 uh, this morning. We'll get there eventually. I want to talk to you uh, today uh, about uh, the significance of Jesus, the significance of Jesus. I almost titled this message The Significance of Christ, but the reason I didn't was because there are people, I, and I even believe in a, in a church like this, in a service like this, there's probably some folks who are here today, you came because someone else invited you, or maybe you don't, you know, you, maybe you've been coming for a while, but you're not sure if there's really any significance to Jesus. And, and so instead of saying the significance of Christ, in order to say that Christ is significant, you need to know that Jesus is significant because Christ means the Messiah. And if you don't know him as Savior and Lord, you're not going to see any significance in him as Christ. So first of all, you need to know, is there any significance in Jesus? And so, I, you know, I was thinking about, okay, if, if uh, you know, if you're going to have to decide whether uh, Jesus was uh, the greatest man who ever lived. By the way, let me say something about this. Uh, there was a few years back where there was an entire movement of people trying to prove that Jesus never even existed. He was just merely a myth. And can I say to you, we now know historically, beyond any shadow of a doubt, irrefutable evidence that there was a man named Jesus. So the question is not whether there was Jesus. The question is, is he the Christ? That's the real giant question. And you, it's a question that you're going to have to face. You're going to have to determine, was he who he said he was or was he a liar? Was he a lunatic? Is, is the Bible not true? You're going to have to make a decision about those things because once you determine that, it's going to determine your future and it's going to determine your eternity. So how do we know? How do we know? So let me just give you this. Uh, I'm going to give you several proofs today, what I believe are proofs, and we're going to look at some things in the Bible, what it says, and what are the proofs out of the Bible. But we're also, I'm going to give you one proof today that I'm going to move outside of the Word of God that is, in my opinion, a proof that Jesus truly was who He said He was, that He was the Christ, Son of the living God. We're going to look at that today. So there's a verse of Scripture in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says, To these He also presented Himself alive after His suffering by many convincing proofs. I want you to notice those words. He, 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 he showed that He was alive by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. When I saw that, I thought, you know, that's a, you know, there are many events historically that would have been really cool to be at. Uh, wouldn't it have been cool to be there the day that Jesus walked on water? Can, can we, wouldn't that have been amazing to be able to see that? I mean, I wish I could have seen that. Uh, there, uh, you know, there, how would you have liked to have been in the house when they tore a hole in the roof and took the lame man and put him down the roof, and Jesus said, take up your mat and walk. Wouldn't that have been incredible to watch this uh, man who had never walked the day of his life? I mean, th there are two miracles that happen there. People, we don't even think about it. First miracle is that Jesus was, healing, was able to heal him of his lame, being lame. The second part was, it's a miracle he knew how to walk. I mean, we don't even think about those things. Wouldn't that have been incredible to be there? I think it would have been incredible to be at the garden tomb on the night of the resurrection. Uh, the Bible says, I mean, you know how incredible that was? The Bible says there were Roman soldiers who were there to guard against anyone stealing his body away so that, they, so that the disciples couldn't say, oh, see, he rose again. So the Roman soldiers were there to try and protect the body of Christ from being stolen away. And the Bible says that when Jesus came out of the tomb, the Roman soldiers, now these are the toughest of the tough, the meanest of the mean, standing there guarding the tomb. And when Jesus walked out, the Bible says they fell down like dead men. That <clears throat> They fainted. Uh, I'm just going to ask the question, how many of you would have fainted if you saw a dead man walk out? <laughs> Let's just be honest. I know some of you are like, oh, not me. Sure, you've been the first one to drop. So anyway, <laughs> I would have liked to have been there. It would have been incredible to experience that. But when he says over a 40-day period, he showed them with many convincing proofs. I think if I had to choose only one time in place to be, I would have loved to have been there when he began to take the word of God and begin to show them, now you didn't know this, but let me show you this. You didn't see this when this was happening, but let me tell you about this. And over a 40-day period, he, he gave them many convincing proofs. Wouldn't that have been an incredible teaching to be under during that? And what's interesting is we're not told what the convincing proofs are. That's really interesting to me. Someone says, why? Why, wouldn't, why would the Lord 
not tell us? Why would they not record the convincing proofs? And here's what I think. I think God didn't record the convincing proofs because some of us would just take it for granted. And what God really wants is for you to search out a matter to find out if Jesus really is significant and be convinced on your own. I think there's something powerful to saying, I'm going to look. I'm going to see if this thing is really true, really real, really true. So I want to give you the significance of Jesus today, but hopefully by the time we leave, you'll say, not only is there significance in Jesus, there's significance in Jesus being the Christ, Son of the living God. There's significance in it. So let's start with this. I want to look at some Old Testament verses about the Christ, about Jesus. And, and, and let me say it like this, it was prophesied. I'm talking about things that were spoken of in the Word of God. Now, here's what you need to know. I'm going to give you some verses in Isaiah. I'm going to give you some verses in Micah. I'm going to give you some verses in Zechariah. I'm going to give you some verses in Jeremiah. These are all Old Testament prophecies. And all of these prophecies occurred between 800 and 500 years before Jesus ever entered the scene. So I'm, I'm just going to say that is an absolutely incredible if he can fulfill these, that would be incredible. Can, can we agree with that? Wouldn't it be incredible? And by the way, there's over 600 prophecies about the Messiah, and Jesus has fulfilled every one of them. That's amazing. So I'm telling you, just by Scripture, how could any one person be able to do that? Now, I actually had someone tell me this, and I thought it was pretty interesting. I've never sat down and done the mathematics on it, but I think it's interesting that uh, in order for one person to fulfill all of these prophecies, it would be like taking one stacks of 100 silver dollars. Okay, think about silver dollars. Taking stacks of silver dollars at 100 deep and filling the entire state of Texas with all of these silver dollars at 100 deep and putting a person in the middle of the state of Texas and saying to them, pick out the right one. The odds of you ever finding the right one is infinitesimal. In other words, it is impossible to accomplish. But here's what's interesting. With Christ, all things are possible. And he was able to do it even when we could never do it. So it was prophesied. So let me show you some verses of Scripture. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, and, and by the way, Isaiah was written 800 years. This is 800 years before Jesus came. Uh, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel uh, first of all let me just show you you know it's interesting it says that there's a virgin that'll be with a child now just can we all admit uh, what is the possibility can we say it was impossible for a virgin? it's impossible even today for a virgin to give birth <laughs> come on yes okay again remember with Christ, all things are, are possible. This is just a sign to say he really was the Messiah. Now, Matthew chapter 1 tells us this story and says that the angel said this, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God is with us. Here's what I want you to know. 800 years before, said this is how you'll know the Messiah. 800 years later, guess what? He is born of a virgin. And that may not be evidence enough for you because you might be going, well, how do we know that she was a virgin? Well, here's the thing. You need to take all the evidence and begin to stack it up. And after a time, when you start seeing the evidence, you go, hmm, okay, that, and then this, and then this, and then this, and you add all that together. And if all these things really were accomplished, he had to be the Christ. So let's just say that's one element of the evidence. Okay, let me give you another one. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says, tells us about where he would be born. But as for you, Bethlehem of, of, of Papareth, too little to be among the clans of Judah. It's just a little small town. Really no significance to it. Too little to be of the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Okay, Here, here's what that said. Uh, he said, there is someone who's going to come from Bethlehem, but don't think that when he is born in Bethlehem that that is really the beginning of him because his days go all the way back to eternity. In other words, this has to be the Messiah. And it's saying he would come from Bethlehem, a shepherd town, a little small town, too insignificant for anything else. But the Bible's telling us from an insignificant town, there would be a Messiah that would be born. Guess what we know about Jesus? Guess where he was born? 
Bethlehem. And I know if you just take the evidence and say, well, you know, there were a lot of people born in Bethlehem. Sure, there were a lot of people born in Bethlehem. But again, it's just another piece of the evidence that when you begin to stack it up, you go, hmm, little evidence here, a little evidence there. At some point, the, over, the evidence becomes overwhelming. Born in Bethlehem. Uh, l- let me show you this. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 11, uh, verse 1, it says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Uh, many, many people have said, yes, he's from Bethlehem, but why is it that the Old Testament not even once ever mentions that he was from Nazareth? And, that's, and that is an interesting thing because, you know, the Bible says he was called the, the Nazarene. Or, or the, uh, so it says Jesus of Nazareth, that he was called the Nazarene. Uh, that he was from that little small town. And, and even Nathaniel had a question about this because they said, oh, come meet the Christ who is from Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, can any good thing come from Nazareth? And in other words, he knew the scriptures that there was nothing good that came from Nazareth. Here's what's interesting, though. If you're not careful, you skip right over the verses that tell us that he was going to be from Nazareth. Now, in this verse, it actually tells us that. Don't you see it? <laughs> Some of you are going, no, we don't see it. Okay. If you were to read it in Hebrew, you would actually catch it. So let me, let me kind of help you a little bit. It says, then a shoot will spring up from the stem of Jesse and a branch. Now that word branch, the Hebrew word there is the word nesert. Nesert literally means a branch, but it's a specific branch. Nesert is uh, the little teeny tiny branch that springs from the base of a grapevine. This little branch that comes off the, almost the root of a grapevine, you can take and you can cut that little nesert off of the main branch and you can go and you can root it and you can grow it and it can become a great vine, a great vine that produces fruit. The word nesert is the word that we get for the word Nazareth, Nazareth, nesert. Okay, here's, here's what's incredible about that. He came from a shepherd's village, but he grew up in Nazareth that was not a shepherd's village. He grew up in Nazareth that was a vineyard. And it says a branch, a nesert from his roots. He's saying his roots will be coming from Nazareth. That's pretty amazing. Isn't that incredible? And he'll bear fruit. What did Jesus bear fruit? Absolutely. Uh, Let me give you another verse about this. By the way, still talking about Nazareth. Listen to this. Jeremiah 23, verse 5 uh, says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up David, a righteous branch, a righteous nesert, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. By the way, this has to be the Messiah. You say, how how does it have to be the Messiah? Okay, listen to me. Has there ever in the history of mankind including modern day, been a righteous king. No. But this has to be the Messiah because he's a righteous king. He will do justice and righteousness in the land. And where is he coming from? From David, from Nasert, a branch. It's pretty amazing. He would be a Nasert. He would be a Nazert Reen. Did y'all catch that? That's who he is. Okay. So, Again, the Bible does, again, it's, it's amazing. The Bible has always said the truth. It's always told us the truth. We can find facts in the Word of God about the Christ. Let me give you another verse. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5 says, And see if these things talk about Christ. See if you know these things about Jesus. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus open the blinded eyes? Yes. The Bible very clearly tells us in the New Testament he opened blinded eyes. And the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Did Jesus open the, de- the ear, the deers, the, e- the ears? I don't think he ever opened the deers, but anyway, did he ever open the ears of deaf people? Yes, the Bible very clearly tells us about that. Then the lame will leap like a deer. Did, did the lame walk? Yes. And the, by the way, again, there's that two miracle thing. Lame, not only walk, but they could leap like a deer. That's a miracle, okay? Watch this. And the tongue of the mute. Did he open the tongue of the mute? With sh- and, 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 and who would shout with joy? Did, did that ever happen? Yes. And then it says, for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in Araba. Okay, here's what he's saying. He's going to be living waters. And in his living waters, he's going to be able to do healings. Here's what I need you to know. There were Old Testament people who did certain miracles, but none was able to do all the miracles. But Jesus did. Messiah did, because he was more than just a prophet. 
He was the Christ, Son of the living God. Uh, let me give you another proof. Again, we're looking at the Scriptures, looking at proof through the Scriptures. In a moment, I'll give you something else. But in Zechariah chapter 12, this is 580 years before Christ went to the cross. It says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me. This is God talking. And they will look on me whom they have pierced. Was Jesus pierced on the cross? Yes. And here's what, here's what 580 years before, God said, one day they're going to look on me. They're going to they're look up on a tree and they're going to see me pierced for them. Uh, and they will look on me. And if you're not sure if that's Messiah, notice this next part. And they will mourn for him as one who mourns for an only son. Remember the verse in the New Testament? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Okay, this verse says, they will mourn for me like they mourn for an only son. Was Jesus an only son? Yes. Was he God's son? Yes. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Was Jesus firstborn? Yes. So I, here's what I want you to get. The Old Testament, again, you're just, we're getting little small pieces of evidence, and you begin to stack up the evidence, and you go, he had to be the Christ. Again, I'm just talking purely through prophecy, because it would be impossible just through prophecy for even you to try and figure out how to fulfill all of these. Now, I, I would dare say some of these verses I've read this morning, you didn't even know existed. And here's the funny thing. How did God know they all existed without computers? And yet he was able to fulfill them. You're going to have to come to grips with that at some point. Let me give you the second thing. Not only was it prophesied, it was planned. This was a part of his plan. Turn over to Mark 15 with me. I want you to see part of the plan today. Mark 15. Look down to verse 25. Okay, I want you to notice this. Again, we're talking about it was so, this is, this is very specific and it was specifically planned out. Okay, watch the plan. It was the third hour when they crucified him. We're just going to pause right there for a minute. I want you to think about the third hour. Now, if we were to say, what's the third hour? People would say, oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe you're a military person. You'd say, oh, oh, 300, 3 a.m. That's 3 a.m. in the morning. No. So uh, when a Jewish person would count hours, they would say there's 12 hours in the day. We know there's 24 hours in the day, but they didn't count the night hours. They only counted the daytime hours. So they would start with hour one, and hour one for them was 6 a.m. In other words, it's early in the morning. It would be 6 a.m. So when the Bible says it was the third hour, what hour was it? Not hard to figure this out, okay? Three plus six is nine. So it was 9 a.m. in the morning. Now, why is that significant? That Jesus was crucified exactly. I mean, it wasn't 9.30. It wasn't 8.30. It was 9 a.m. Why is that so specific? Okay, why? Because at 9 a.m. every day, the Jews would begin to pray. Every day, 9 a.m. That's significant. Someone says, why is it significant? Okay, do you know what they were praying for at 9 a.m.? That the Messiah would come. At the very moment that they're praying, dear God, bring us a Savior, the Savior was on a cross in that very moment. That's significant. I'm talking about this is a plan. He didn't do this by accident. Let me, let me read some other things that were specific. Verse 26 says, The inscription of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on the right and one on the left, and the scripture was fulfilled which says, He was numbered with the transgressors. By the way, notice that word fulfilled. He's talk, it's talking about an Old Testament reference saying that Jesus would be hung or that the Christ would be hung between thieves. And it was fulfilled. Now, do you think that Jesus was walking up the hill and said, okay. And by the way, there were probably hundreds of people who had been crucified that day. But specifically, the Bible tells us about two. Do you think Jesus walking along going, oh, not that one. Oh, not that one. Oh, there's two thieves. Put me between them. That's where I want to be. Or do you think it might have been a part of a plan? That God had already planned this hundreds of thousands of years before to give his son's life for you. It's incredible. So he says it was fulfilled. Verse 29 says, Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads, and saying, Ha! You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. How many days was he going to rebuild the temple? Three days. Who said that? Jesus said, I'll rebuild the temple in three days. I'll destroy it and I'll rebuild it in three days. And then uh, the ne very next verse says, Save yourself and come down from the cross. He said, if you, th if you really can do this, why don't you just save yourself? Well, he didn't come down from the cross because he didn't come to save himself. He came to save mankind. 
Now think with me, how in the world would he, how would he rebuild the temple in three days? Okay, the Bible says on that day, when he died, you can read about it uh, in these stories, on the day that he died in the temple, the veil, uh, the curtain that stood between the holy place and the holy of holy place, the Bible says on that day there was an earthquake and the veil was ripped in two. Literally, that, an opening made in the veil. Now, what was happening in the holy place? That was the place where the presence of God resided, in the temple. It was in a temple built with the hands of men. <coughs> now, let me, let me just show you how in three days Jesus rebuilt the temple. So You've got to catch this. This is amazing. So up until that moment, the presence of God was, he was held in a building. But after that time, when Jesus came out of the grave, three days later, he, built, he made a way for the temple to become the body and the person of, the hu of humanity. We now can have the presence of God in three days. He gave us the temple. We, the Bible says, do you not know that you are the temple of God? He did it in three days. That's amazing. Again, just showing to us that it is a prophecy about the Christ. Watch this, verse 31 says, In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves, saying, He saves others, and he cannot save himself. By the way, they're admitting that he did some stuff that was incredible. He saved others, but he's not saving himself. By the way, it wasn't that he could not. He was still there for you and I. Let this Christ, King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Key words. Here's what they're saying. If we could see it, we would believe it. I mean, these are the same people who watched him do these incredible miracles, and they couldn't believe it. So they said, if we could just see it, it's really important. If we could see it, we could believe it. Those who were crucified him were also insulting him. Now watch this. Again, remember they said, see and believe. Now watch this. When the sixth hour came, okay, help me. Okay, the third hour is 9 a.m. What's the sixth hour? Noon, 12 o'clock, right? 12 o'clock. Okay, can we say at 12 o'clock, that's the moment when the sun is the highest in the sky? Can we all agree with that? Come on, this is... Okay, shake your head or something. Make sure you're awake. So he says, at noon, the moment when the sun is the brightest, when it was the sixth hour, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Here's what they said. If we could see something, we would believe. How long did the darkness last? Three hours. until From noon to what time? What's the ninth hour? 3 p.m.? Okay, I know what someone's going to say. Well, now, Pastor, this is really easy to explain. This is a solar eclipse that has taken place. Okay, l let, me, let me tell you why it's absolutely impossible for it to be a solar eclipse. Okay, you, you, I want you to catch this. This is the day of preparation, the day before Passover. Passover always occurs on the 14th day following the new moon. Okay, the moon has a cycle of 28 days. We're halfway through the moon cycle from the new moon. Okay, so... Here's, here's what happened. Here's the sun at its highest point. Here's the earth. And here's the moon. It's on the opposite side of the earth. It couldn't be an eclipse. I hope that you're catching this. And even if, I know someone's going to go, well, pastor, they just got it wrong. They didn't know what they were talking about, and it was. It was, it was no matter how you put it, it's a solar eclipse. Okay, let's just say it was a solar eclipse. Let's just say the moon passed in front of the sun, and a solar eclipse took place that day. Okay, let's just say it. Do you know how long a solar eclipse lasts? Seven minutes, 31 seconds. I looked it up. <laughs> this lasted for three hours. This is something different. This is something significant. Again, this is that I'm not using the Bible right now. I want to show you something because if that kind of event took place, don't you think there were some historical writers who wrote about this be outside of biblical writers? That they didn't know what was going on. They're just writing, recording something. So I started looking up. There, it's funny. You can go and look up articles, and here's what people will say. They'll say, this never occurred. If, there were, if this had ever occurred, there have been people who would have written about it. And that was my argument. I thought, well, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So I began to dig in, in about one hour of time of doing research, and that's not very long. In about an hour of time, I found three different articles that talked about this event that took place that are outside, completely outside of, of biblical. In other words, these weren't Bible writers. They were just writing something that had happened on the day. Now, I'm not going to read for you all three, but I am going to read for you one, and the reason I chose this one is because it's the shortest. Okay? So this is... Philegion, who was a Greek historian 
and wrote extensively about chronology, okay? And here's what he said. In the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, by the way, that's important that he wrote that, and I think God actually had him to write these words. Why? Because we know the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad was absolutely, without a doubt, A.D. 33. Why A.D. 33? Why is that significant? Because A.D. 33 was the year Jesus was crucified on the cross. So he's writing about an event that took place during Jesus' crucifixion. He says, in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, there was, a, there was the greatest eclipse of the sun. The greatest eclipse of the sun. In other words, they didn't know how to describe it. They didn't know what it was. They didn't have any scientific reason. They, it must have been an eclipse. They didn't know. There was the greatest eclipse of the sun and that it became night in the sixth hour of the day so that the stars even appeared in the heavens. There was a great earthquake in Bithynia and many things were overturned. Okay. I hope you caught what he just said. There was the greatest eclipse ever that occurred. And he said there was a great earthquake. And you know what the Bible says? That at Jesus' death, there was a great earthquake. He wasn't recording anything about the Christ. He was just saying something different has happened. I want you just to think. You're, listen, if you don't believe in Jesus as Christ, you're going to have to come to grips with this one thing. How was there three hours of darkness so dark that you could see the stars? Now, I, I've had the privilege to live long enough now to see a couple of solar eclipses. Uh, I, won, I remember one particular solar eclipse. Uh, I actually I had this hatchback uh, thing that had a really dark window tent on it. And so I, I backed it up so it was underneath the sun and lifted up the hatch like this. And I put a mirror down like this. And I put my darkest sunglasses I could get on so that I could look into the mirror and see the literal, you could literally watch the solar eclipse pass by. Okay, here's what you need to know. It wasn't dark enough to see the stars. In fact, you look up at a solar eclipse like that, you're going to burn your eyes. It's still daylight in an eclipse. And this writer, not a biblical writer, says you could see the stars. What in the world happened for three hours? And what they said was, if we could see something, we'd believe. And Jesus said, let me show you something that's not natural. Let me show you something that's supernatural. I'm telling you, if you don't come to grips with anything else, you better realize he was the Christ, son of the living God. I don't know what happened, but somehow he put out the sun for three hours. That's incredible. Right? Okay. Watch this next verse. At the ninth hour, verse 34. Okay, what was the ninth hour? 3 p.m. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, you, you need to catch this. This statement, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is actually a prophetic statement from Psalms chapter 22. You can go and read it for yourself. Do you think Jesus is on the cross and went, oh, sh I almost died. I, I better say this before I die. Are, do you understand that he's fulfilling prophecy and he's not even having to struggle to get it done? It's incredible. When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, behold, he's calling for Elijah. They didn't even understand what he was talking about. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink saying, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Okay, what time of the day did he utter a loud cry and breathe his last? What time? 3 p.m. Okay, there are other gospel writers who say, they tell us what the loud cry was. The last thing that he cried out was, it is finished. And then the Bible says he gave up the ghost. He died. Now, why is that significant? Because this is preparation day. And every year on preparation day, at exactly 3 o'clock, every year, the high priest for that year is on the temple mount with the Passover lamb. And he takes a knife and he cuts the throat of the lamb and he has a bowl and catches the blood. And they take the blood and they apply it to the mercy seat. And at this moment, the high priest 
at 3 o'clock every year cries out with a loud voice, it is finished. And at the very moment that a high priest is sacrificing a lamb, the high priest of all high priests and the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, is on Calvary's cross. And as high priest, as lamb shedding his blood, and as high priest declaring, it is finished. And then he died. Now let me give you some significance to this. The big question has been asked, who killed Jesus? Okay, listen to me very clearly. The Jews have said it was the Romans. Gentiles have said it was the Jews. Okay, listen to me. Can I propose to you that it was neither one? I would propose to you the Jews didn't kill him, the Gentiles didn't kill him, but that he laid down his life willingly. Amen. Now, here's what you got you to see. It, it, you could literally be on the cross for days and not die. Days. See, here's what would happen. You'd be hanging on the cross like this. And literally to catch a breath, what would happen is because you were sagging down like this, your lungs would begin to fill with fluid. And in order to breathe, you would push up. And you could take a breath. And then you would sag back down again. Well, the Romans knew that there was a special day coming on, and they had to hurry up and finish this entire cruel thing, procedure. So they began to go criminal to criminal, and they were breaking their legs. And the reason they broke their legs was so that they couldn't push up to breathe anymore. And literally within minutes, everyone who was hanging on the cross would be dead. And they came to Jesus, and they were shocked. The Romans, I mean, just brilliant at torture, were shocked that Jesus was already dead. Okay, listen to me. The Romans didn't kill him. The Jews didn't kill him. He willingly gave it up. Died for our sins. I'd say it this way. That's why the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, it's a gift, his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him, they would not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did this willingly. So let me give you the last part. Uh, it was prophesied. It was planned. Here's the third thing. It was purposed. He had a purpose in mind. Let me say it a different way. You're his purpose. He did it for you. 800 years prior Isaiah wrote these words, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. How many of you know that we've all sinned? How many of you know we've all fallen short of the glory of God? We, and this is 800 years before there was a Christ. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. How many of you know, just like me, we tend to want to do our own thing? <laughs> Think that we can do it our own way. We each turn to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us all he was perfect but God placed my sins Mark Allen's sins on Jesus and that day he paid for Mark Allen's sins in fact you put your name there he paid for all of humanity's sins that day well someone says okay well if he paid for my sins how do I get in on this well he made a way for that Romans chapter 10 verse 8 says but what does it say? When it says it, it's talking about the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? The Word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. Here, here, you need to get this. As I'm speaking today, some of you are hearing these words, talking about the Word of God, but there is another voice that's not, the, not Pastor Mark's. There is the voice of God who is speaking His Word, and it says it's near you, uh, it is in your mouth, and it is in your heart. And you're hearing God speak to you right now saying, you know I'm the right way. You know that I'm the truth. You know that I'm the life. You know that no one comes to the Father except by me. And he is speaking words to you, even as I've been talking this morning. And the conviction of God is saying, why don't you do it my way? Why don't you do it my way? He said, it is near you. 
This is, this is the process for being saved. That, that is the word of faith which we are preaching. And again, this is a faith issue. If you confess with your mouth, the Bible says, Jesus is Lord. You say it with your mouth. Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God is, uh, has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. That's the amazing thing about Christianity. It's an easy process. It doesn't say if you do good and you do right and you do it for long enough, then you can be saved. What it says is you confess that Jesus is Lord and you believe that God raised him from the dead. Is that pretty simple? You'll be saved. Now, how does that work? Verse 10 says, for with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says... Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Can I tell you, I've done a lot of things in my life that I have disappointed myself in. Anyone else? I've disappointed myself. There's a lot of people who've been around me that have also disappointed me. Anyone know people like that? Disappointed you? But I can tell you this, there's one who will never disappoint. His name is Jesus. And here's what I want to say to you. Jesus is significant because he's the Christ. And you're going to have to come to grips with whether you choose to believe or not believe. But I can tell you this, if you'll choose to believe, he'll never disappoint you. Best decision you'll ever make in your entire life.